Hello and welcome to the Wisdom Cricket Weekly Podcast and it's a special episode. The 2024 Wisdom Cricketers Almanac is released this week with all the annual awards that come with it. We'll be talking about the 2024 Wisdom as well as some of the latest county action, a bit on the IPL and more. I'm Yazron and with me today are Lawrence Booth, the Wisdom Editor, and Mark Butcher, the man with the most England Test appearances without being named a Wisdom Cricketer of the year. Uh, we'll get to that later. Uh, Harsh. <laughs> Lawrence, Even great. My to- old man got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lawrence, great to have you with us. Let's get straight into it. Um, first on the Wisdom Five, how are they chosen? How are they chosen? Yeah. Um, they, it's the emphasis is on the previous English summer, and they can't have been chosen before. Those are mm. the two criteria, and I think about it all summer. Talk to people, and then the buck stops with me. At the end, I I choose the five. Cool. And away um, we go. So who are the five? They are in alphabetical order. Harry Brook, Ashley Gardner, Usman Kawaja, Mitchell Stark and Mark Wood. Um, that's very Ashes heavy. Four yes. from the men's Ashes, one from the women's Ashes. Yeah. Um, is that in part a reflection of how that series was, was by some distance the, the main bit of the, of the English summer in a way that not all Ashes series are? Yeah, partly. Um, I mean, look, you, you begin each summer and end it looking to choose the best five from the available criteria. That's what. That's the only thing I do. I don't kind of think, oh, someone might win it in five years' time, so I'll hang on, I'll park mm. them, or oh, the Ashes is bigger than county cricket. I mean, if someone had averaged 120 in county cricket and scored at 90 per 100 balls, they'd have been in. They're, they're, everyone gets in the debate. It's just that these five struck me as the standout five for the year. Mm. You've you've been with an editor now for, uh, what, just over a decade? This is my 13th. 13th. Yeah. Um, was that the most exciting test series, do you think, that we've had in English summer um, in, in your wisdom reign so far? Yeah, in that time, definitely. I mean, it's the most exciting since the 05 Ashes, mm. which was the most exciting since the 81 Ashes. So I think it was up there. I think it was up there with those two other great modern Ashes series. And had they had it not rained in Manchester, I know that Aussies are sick and tired of hearing this, but England would have be, might have become the second team in Test history to turn a 2-0 deficit mm. into a 3-2 win. 36-37 Aussies did it under Bradman. So we were, we were quite close to something truly sensational, as it was coming back from 2-0 down to draw 2 all with Australia. was still pretty good. No team mm. in Test history had ever done that, by the way. Australia mm. had never given up a 2-0 lead. So for all the criticism that the Baz Ball has got in the first two tests, you know, some of it legitimate, not, I didn't agree with all of it. They still did pretty well to turn it round. I think previous England teams might have turned a 2-0 deficit into a 4-0 deficit. <laughs> but we were, we were standing with Brendan McCullum after Lords on the outfield and he said, 3-2 has a nice ring to it. Mm. A pretty outrageous thing for an England coach to say. And he almost, he almost got it right. So it was mm. a great series. Um, that brings us on nicely to Australia and, and Pat Cummins won one of the other big awards, the leading men's cricketer in the world. Um, Butch, I sort of wonder... Cummins is now 30. There aren't that many um, bowling captains in recent test history. A lot of the ones who are bowlers actually are generally all rounders as well. I wonder if over the last year or so, we've seen, we, kn- we knew how good a pure bowler mm. he was, but as a leader and a reader of cricket matches, we've seen Australia across formats. And now even with Cummins in the IPL with no IPL record really behind him before becoming the Sunrisers captain, he really is up there as... Um, in a very, very different way to Stokes, but as, as one of the great sort of readers of a game of cricket. Yeah, absolutely. I think his partnership with um, with Andrew McDonald has been has been fabulous. You know, they, they kind of picked up from the legacy of having to sort of turn around and clean up the the image of Australian cricket and sort of wearing all of the uh, um, all of the the sort of puritanical um, problems of, of the game on on their shoulders. Uh, and what started off as being sort of like a very, um, a very unpromising beginning, I think they, they've turned it into. Well, they've turned Australia back into the powerhouse of world cricket, as we as we've kind of come to um, think of them, um, and also have, have carried off some extraordinary victories. Really, I mean, beating India in the World Test Championship was another huge feather in, in their cap, and they did it in huge style as well. I mean, mm. it was a, it was a drubbing um, in the end. And uh, and the 50 over World Cup, very very similar. So you, holding all three of those things at the same time, undisputedly the best team in the world, and have done it in a way that, that at times required a little bit of lateral thinking. It wasn't just simply we've got the best eleven, mm. we'll go out there and batter everybody. Um, you know that they had to 
they had to come up with some uh, some interesting strategies. Uh, had to make some big decisions around picking and dropping certain players. Um, you know, the, the the waiting, the hanging on for Travis Head to keep him in the squad. With the keep injured, him in the yeah. squad with the broken finger, and then he turns out to be you know the player of the match in the final and and, and sort mm. of player of the tournament. Um, all of those things um, have, have the adversity of losing Nathan Lyon mm. um, uh, during the Ashes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which perhaps didn't go quite so well. Um, but 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 nevertheless, mm. all of the uh, the achievements that they've managed to pull off un- under him have been uh, nothing short of sensational. Mm. And he still managed to to still be one of the most potent forces with the new ball and the old, old ball, and it's kind of reinvented himself a little bit as a white ball cricketer, bowling middle overs rather than than top of the game, um, as well as leading leading a, a troop of men to great success. So it's thoroughly deserved. Very well done. Great. Thank pick. you very much. Very mm-hmm. good. Yeah. And, and, and as much as uh, we might mention the the rain in Manchester, I think we're we're right. To to point to Lyon's injury, um, Lyon's obviously um, been such a big part of Australia's success under um, Cummins. And I, and I wonder as well, obviously it didn't go well for England in India, but up until that point, there was almost an admirable um, stubbornness to, to Cummins and, and how Australia just sort of just, like, we are going to do this. We're not going to get drawn in by what England are doing. We're going to stick to our guns, you know. I think I think in uh, your notes, you point, you compare uh, Kawaja's series to, to Zach Crawley's, you know, two openers who basically score the same number of runs, but Kawaja faced two and a half times the number of deli- deliveries. Part of what made that such a watchable series was the contrasting styles, and at the end of it all, it was 2-2. Yeah, I mean, I think to a degree, Australia, were they decided to be the anti basball team, didn't they? Kawaja especially. Kawaja, mm. Kawaja personified that. He was... As a series progressed, he got more and more stubborn. In fact, you know, Mark Wood is one of our five cricketers. When he bowled Kawadra at Headingley on that first morning, knocked his leg stump out. That was almost the moment where England began to believe that mm. they could actually turn it round against Australia because Kawadra had won them the first test at Edgbaston, 140 and 65 in the chase. And without him, possibly England would have won the Ashes. Um, mm. So, yes, but, but Cummins was... I mean, look, Cummins began the series with a deep point, don't forget. Yep. Crawley laced him through covers through the cover uh, for four, so there was a degree of of um, bending the knee to the baz ballers, mm. but he knew he thought he knew what he was doing, and you have to say results bore him out. And also, I mean, Butch mentioned his bowling. Without his runs at Edgbaston in the first test, they're not winning that game. Mm. Um, and he in the end he ended up with forty two test wickets last year, which is more than any seamer in world cricket. You forget mm. that with all the all the captaincy stuff that was going yeah. on. Mm-hmm. So yeah, an astonishing player and he's, he's risen to great heights. I, I, I think it's, it's quite interesting though, I mean, you kind of sort of reviewing the, the first two test matches, but that the, the England gave him such a leg up and the, and the whole sort of sitting back, um, you know, not having catches in, keeping men on the boundary actually was what undid them in the, in the, in the final um, three games, I thought. But you know the, the history is is, re, is rewritten or is always written by the by the victors. They held on to the ashes because of the, the weather at Manchester. Um, the leg that legacy might be very different had England not been quite so uh, profligate in allowing them or giving them chances to to win those first two Test matches. But you know at the end of it all, thoroughly deserves uh, every accolade he gets. Mm. Um, there weren't just five. Um... Very entertaining Ashes Test matches last year. There was a sixth in the women's Test match as well, and one of the stars of that Test match, Ash Gardner, was one of the cricketers mm. of the year. Um, that that was a, a brilliant Test and a one hell of a performance from from Gardner. Yeah, it's terrific. What she got twelve wickets at the second best Test figures in in women's history, and and won it really. I mean, it was, what were England fifty? They'd raced to fifty without loss mm. in that chase in the fourth innings, and they were kind of doing a. I know they like, don't like being compared with the men, but they were sort of doing it a basball way. Bowman had got a double hundred first time round and looked like she, you know, she was going to get England over the line again. And Gardner was the one who intervened, um, eight for, uh, and it was a brilliant spell. And she, she's been an incredibly underrated player for a long time, actually. You know, you look at Australia and think of Lanning, who's retired now, Perry, Beth Mooney, uh, these people. But but um, Gardner is incredibly reliable and took took three threefers in the ODIs that followed. So. I mean, she just squeezed out Sophie Eccleston, actually, who also took 10 for in that test match. But Gardner's contribution basically ensured that Australia retained the Ashes despite England fighting mm. back in a, in a great series. Mm. Um, I'm just going to run through some of the other big award winners. So Travis Head won the Wisden Trophy for the best test performance of the year for his 100 in the World Test Championship final. Nat Brunt was named the leading women's cricketer in the world. Um, and Hayley Matthews Lawrence became the first female winner of the leading T20 player in the world. People might not be aware of what she did to get it, but 
boy did she deserve this. Well, <laughs> yeah, or girl did she deserve it. Yes. I mean, she eight eight consecutive Player of the Match awards, um, <laughs> which the previous record, we looked into this, we thought, well, it must be some kind of record and wisdom. We kind of want to get these things right. The previous record was four. Oh, wow. So she did twice as well <laughs> as the best previous sequence. And she scored, she helped West Indies win in Australia, win a game in Australia. I mean, it was, and not only was she scoring runs very quickly, she was taking lots of wickets very cheaply. So she was at the end of it. You looked at it and go, these this sets of figures is is irresistible. She has mm. to be the choice, um, and it's great to give it to a woman. We've always said it's open to women's cricketers, and people say, well, none of them none of them has ever won it. So Haley Matthews, um, well deserved first time winner. Um, the Wizen Trophy famously was the uh, trophy awarded to the winner of the England West Indies Test series until quite recently. Um, it is now given to the. Uh, best test performance of the year so this is the second time it's been awarded but also this year you uh, unveiled the list of winners since the war retrospectively um and some high profile players not in it i was look, look at, looking through the list of winners no no ben stokes no virat Kohli, no shane warren no sachin you Tendulka. had to go negative the negative slant on it didn't uh, you? no mark butcher as well i was gonna say <laughs> no mark well that's the worst <laughs> In 2001, Butch came close. La- Lakshman's 281 trumping it, Butch's 173. It just 173. nipped his 173 yeah. at Headingley. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was tricky. I mean, you, yeah, Stokes came close, obviously, for 2019 at Headingley, mm. but we, we gave it to Pereira, who scored 153 at Durban, mm. yeah. including a last wicket stand of roughly the same as Stokes and Leach. And we just, I mean, you have to make a choice. And we gave it to him because Sri Lanka had only ever won one test in South Africa previously. And we thought Sri Lanka winning in South Africa just beats England winning at home to Australia, even though everyone who was at Leeds that day will tell you that Stokes' innings mm. was the best they'd ever seen. So that was that was as hard as it got. Actually, 81 wasn't easy because you, you boil, it boils down to one, one you game. Yeah. Is, it, is it Botham or Willis? Mm. Uh, Headingley. And actually, yeah. the, when you look at that scorecard, you forget that Botham took six for in Australia's first innings, then scored a 50 in England's first innings and everyone else was collapsing. That Famously, yeah. they followed on. So he kind of, without everything he did, and then his 149 not out, without everything he did, Willis wouldn't have been in the position to take eight for so we we gave it to both and not not saying what willis did was rubbish but it's just mm. had to make a choice I, I was doing continuity um in the in the in the gallery um at sky for Pereira's innings um and so anybody that that didn't see it or or can't imagine that there was a, a better innings than ben stokes in in the, over the course of that year um it was utterly sensational yeah. <laughs> um which is not to say that ben stokes wasn't but when you add in all of the other criteria um, the, the dismantling of, of um, Dale Stain and, mm. and company um, and of course the, another last wicket partnership uh, their only win in South Africa yeah I guess, I guess it's a tough one but it was but it was folks it was very very yeah, very good and, and, and as good as <laughs> and as good as that Australia attack was that Stokes gets his 1-3-5 against the South Africa attack that Pereira gets his 1-5-3 against Philander, Robada and Stain mm. that's, that's pretty good that's pretty good. That's a that's a hard one to to argue against. Um, the the award winners um, in the wisdom don't actually take up that high percentage of the pages. There's a lot more than just the award winners, although that is a lot of what people talk about. Um, up top, there are also the editor's notes. That is a sort of state of the game health check. Um, in this year's editor's notes, you call for one poorer nations to be given a bigger piece of the pie which i guess isn't a hugely controversial idea outside of india um but i thought quite interestingly you also argue for four day test matches um do you want to talk us through the the reasoning for that yeah w- w- lots of caveats for the four day test i the, 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 we're seeing a lot of these two match series because boards outside the so-called big three england india australia can't afford to host test cricket and they want to get the test series out of the way as quickly as possible before they get onto the lucrative white ball stuff so my suggestion is Give these countries the option, if they want, of staging four-day test matches. You might then squeeze in a three-match series. Um, uh, it will get rid of the dreadful two-match series, which you know sometimes end one all and you're desperate for a decider. Um, you could stage them Friday to Monday, so you've got guaranteed weekend cricket. A lot of the games, I was looking at the test matches last year, not, not that many that weren't rain-affected went into a fifth day in any case. Uh, and if, there, if a whole day was lost to rain, you could budget in an extra day if you wanted for these four-day games. I'm just looking at ways to kind of keep test cricket relevant in the countries that have all, are almost giving up on it. You know, South Africa famously this year sent a third-string team to New Zealand because they're all playing, they're all contracted to play in the SA20 back home. I understand the economics of that. I, I get why it's happening. Mm. So I'm trying to be pragmatic and looking at ways to keep 
uh, test cricket going in these other nations. Um, it's not saying five-day cricket's rubbish, it needs to be four-day cricket, which may be how it gets presented a bit on social media. It's just looking at a sort of a, a proactive way of keeping it alive. Mm. Uh, but what are your thoughts on that idea? Yeah, I, I, like, I mean, the, the, the pragmatic reasoning behind it is, it, it is pretty sound, I think. It's difficult to argue against. Um, I, the, on, the only one thing that I would, that I would take exception to um, would be the idea of, of, of the fifth day being, um, uh, being superfluous because of the amount of matches that finish in, in four days. I think um, if, if, you, if you imagine you're hanging on over, over a cliff um, and you've got 20 seconds to do it, you might, just, you might survive, but you add another 20 seconds or you, whatever, then you mm. might well fall to your death. Um, the, the, the fifth day is sometimes what accelerates a game to, to a finish because you know, the, the team will find itself in a position where they can't or they feel that there is just simply too long to hold out, hold out for a draw and so therefore they kind of throw the towel in. Um, you take away that extra day, and then suddenly you, you probably you, what you'll probably find is that there are more drawn games, more drawn mm. test matches, and and of course the onus then goes on the captains. And Ben Stokes has famously done this, um, you know, in, in the baseball area where he's tried to put time back into the game by playing at an accelerated rate. And so you'd expect um, teams to do that in four day cricket if if possible. But I, but I just uh, the, the the idea that the fifth day. Is, is is not necessary because ma most matches finish within four you might find that that actually that actually doesn't mm. make quite as much sense in practicality because as i say you, get, you kind of find yourself in a situation where the draw is only it's sort of like a day away as opposed as opposed to two and then suddenly you know teams are, are much more sort of incentivized to cling on for uh, for that final point so you might end up with slightly less exciting cricket yeah, yeah. Well, well i think that, that's fair i mean I, I suppose the hope would be that captains might sort of decide right let's play a more entertaining brand let's yeah. see what stokes has done the onus is on us now to keep this format going yeah um let, let's let's up the rate and, and it, what it what it does do as well is that if you find yourself i suppose if you find yourself as a captain having you know gambled a little bit and tried to put the foot on the accelerator again it gives you a little bit it gives you a bit more of a chance of kind of rectifying that that problem or, or the, the mess you've got yourself into because you've only got the fourth day to, to last and not the fifth day going into it. So mm. perhaps it does encourage teams um, with a little bit less jeopardy um, to, to do exactly that. I, I'd, I'd be interested to see it. It's just, you know, obviously having played a few of them and, and, and had them as five days throughout my life, it feels like a, it feels like a death in some ways to sort of like concede that, um, you know, the five day game um, needs to change in, in one way or another. But there are certainly there are certainly decent enough reasons to, to do so, um, in in particularly in places where, as you say, the the finances kind mm. of and and the amount of time that the squeeze that the the calendars get um, are making five day cricket less palatable to even bother to play. So, you know, taking the the lesser of two evils, you'd rather people play it yeah, than not at all. A hundred percent. And also, you know, when we talk about some countries paying less and less of it, these are countries that are still bloody good at it. You know, New Zealand World Test Championship winners not that long ago. They basically only played two Test Series. South Africa, you mentioned, uh, they beat India <laughs> a few months ago, uh, and they're they're playing less and less of it. I guess, uh, Lawrence, I was interested to, to hear how how immediate is your concern about the future of, of Test cricket? We've got Sri Lanka and West Indies coming over this summer. Um, given the way the schedule has has been over the last few years, it's been a while since we've had um, two non uh two two non-major countries i guess coming over um it feels like this might be the last time that that happens given the way it's going with with countries in, like Sri Lanka and West Indies paying less and less test cricket how, yeah so how, how immediate is your concern I think my concerns accelerated I mean wisdom famously prophesies the death of test cricket every year pretty well <laughs> <laughs> always has done it's, it's in my contract when I joined like, to say in the editor's notes but it feels closer now I mean interestingly the basballers I think of have, have postponed that moment because I mean for example they they sold out the test the, the tickets for Edgbaston against West Indies in December now that had never ha had never happened so early for mm -hmm. a non-ashes test match and I think that was a direct consequence of people going I want to watch these guys so even though it's only West Indies and Sri Lanka this summer I think people will be interested to see how England go at them mm. how quickly they can score I mean they may, they may come undone the West Indies have just won a test match in Brisbane so they're, they're not a bad team Sri Lanka have got some great young uh, batsmen so but you you have to look at it in the round and say that England India Australia are all playing each other five match series next year by the way England host India for five then go to Australia for five they're playing each other all the time it's the other countries that we have to be very concerned about 
And Test cricket will be really boring if it's just three teams taking mm. it seriously. South Africa are already not taking it seriously. New Zealand, as you say, deserve a, a greater chunk of the pie. Um, and these teams are only playing three match series now when they come to England, mm. West Indies and Sri Lanka. They, they don't do that uh, generally. So yes, it is a concern. And the, the number of T20 franchise tournaments is only growing. In, you know, the ECB central contracts that Rob Key handed out at the end of last year were a direct reflection of the choices that players have to make now. Mark Wood made a comment to the Daily Telegraph about, I might consider the ILT20. And that sent ECB into, into panic and they mm. gave them, they offered him a three-year contract. So the administrators having to think laterally now about how to uh, make the five-day game attractive. Mm. Um, reminder that the 2024 Wizard comes out on Thursday. So in two days time after this episode, comes out um Lawrence what else is in the wisdom because there are a lot of people listening to this who haven't got on before um and we've uh, we've still only talked about the first what, 200 pages of it and there's, there's a lot more than 200 yeah, pages gosh. well I mean within those 200 300 sort of front of book pages which is the sort of the read the reedy bit of wisdom yeah. um we've got Rob Smythe's done a very quite a fun piece on it's 250 years since the LBW law was introduced so he, he looks back on how the kind of morality of LBW and he quotes, um, talks about Phil Tufnell trying to get the Jimmy Adams out and Shivnery and <laughs> in the West. You were on that tour, probably, Butch. When no, they, I wasn't. Oh, no, you know, I, I do remember. They yeah. started giving Jimmy fun Paddams, yeah. yeah, Jimmy Paddams. In <laughs> fact, he, he quotes Jimmy Paddams, who, who says he you know, was never greatly aware of the nickname. But, so I think Rob introduced him to that. So that's, it's quite a fun piece there. Um, Andy Bull gets, it's another old subject, but I think it picked up, or well, slowed down, actually. Overrates is a question last mm. year where... England lost a lot of points because of there was this change mid-series, which Usman Khawaja lobbied the ICC yeah. for, that if an innings is over before 80 overs are up, it's wiped from the records. It doesn't has nothing to do with uh, uh, the over eight. So that obviously benefited in, uh, Australia, who were bowling England out in you know 79 overs regularly. They were yeah. scoring more quickly. Um, and we, the weird thing we worked out was that England England's over eight was better than Australia's throughout that series <laughs> overall, but they lost mm. so many points that it kind of scuppered their... World Test Championship hope. Yeah. So Andy looks back at the, the history of over eight. How did we slow down? Why has it happened? Why is nothing mm. being done about it? Um, as you say, we did the the, the, the the retrospective of the Wisdom Trophy winners. Um, Devon Malcolm gets in there. Uh, the You Guys are history what was spell. That? 95, in, in 90, was it? 94. No, 94, yeah. yeah. Actually, pipping Brian Lara's 375, which wasn't <laughs> an easy choice, but we kind of thought, well, Devon helped win a game, yeah. square a series. Lara was. Um, uh, he didn't. It was a, it was a draw. Mm. Lara's four hundred does get in because we thought, well, you can't ignore a Test quadruple four hundred <laughs> for goodness' sake, <laughs> even though that was a draw and they'd already lost the series three 0 Butch was in that one, I think. Mm -hmm. um, Enid Bakewell gets in in nineteen sixty nine. She's coming to the Wisden dinner. She scored a hundred, a sixty, took a five for and a three for in Christ Test in Christchurch. It's sort of easy to forget. Um, so there are lots of things. Emma John's written a piece about Wisden and Desert Island discs. The number of people, the guests who've chosen Wisden as their book of choice um because peter white came on last year and he chose the 1963 wisdom i think so he wanted to read about hampshire 62 or 63 he wanted to read about hampshire winning the county championship okay. so we looked into previous <laughs> guests and there was something like 14 who chosen including gary lineker yeah um who wanted wisdom so, sorry it's a desert island disc to, to read about hampshire winning the county championship that that's that's such a small part of the wisdom you know, that won't take Well, you can read the long. rest of it as yeah. well. So it's a bonus choice, okay, really. Yeah. It's, in, it's an interesting choice. Yeah. <laughs> it was niche. I'll give him that. But anyway, it gave us a chance to do a piece on it. Um, so, yeah, there's lots of pieces. There are about 15 to 18 front yeah. of book pieces apart from all the awards. And it's always fun commissioning them. And hopefully it's fun reading them. Yeah. Um, out this Thursday. Um, a reminder also that we are only four or so weeks away from our next live show, which is down at the Hank and Ginger Cafe by Oval Tube Station. It's on Thursday, May the 9th. Uh, Butch will be there. I'll be there. Phil will be there. Ben will be there. Katya will be there. And our special guest will be there too. That is Lauren Winfield-Hill who will be joining us. Uh, the last one was very good fun. Um, rem a reminder that it is not recorded. So you get to hear what we really think. Um, <laughs> there'll be an extended... Every week, mate. Every week. <laughs> there'll be an extended uh, Q&A of sorts towards the end. Uh, 22 quid. Get stuck in. Genuinely... They are selling out, so if you want to get a ticket, make sure you get it in the you next get a week or so. Feed and and as much as much white and red wine as you can handle as well, if I remember rightly, last time. Yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah. No, maybe yeah. not. Quite maybe that maybe much. not quite this time. But, <laughs> but sounds like you shouldn't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> there will be there will be food and drink available there. 
Um, yesterday, we had the very sad news uh, that the legendary England and Kent spinner, Derek Underwood, passed away at the age of 78. Um, it was a bit trite summing up a man's life with numbers, but they do give a picture of his pedigree as a cricketer. 297 test wickets at 26, more wickets than any other English spinner, 2,465 first-class wickets. Um, a great of the English game. Uh, 1,000 first-class wickets, by the way, by the age of 25. Um <laughs> Butch, uh, you, you would have seen him, I guess. Um, I saw it, yeah, yeah. I did see him. I, I, my sort of memories of of watching him, but because obviously I didn't see him um, on Uncover Wickets, but my memories of watching him bowl are thinking, oh my God, he would have been utterly unplayable on Uncover Wickets. Um, and also watching Alan not keep wicket to him. Mm. Um, you know, bowling bowling sort of 75 mile an hour leg breaks. Well, you know, the orthodox left arm spin, but the thing jumping and turning and Notty taking it like it was a, a walk in the park. Um, I had the, the the pleasure of meeting him um, on more than one occasion, sort of, uh, you know, when he was, I think he was chairman of Kent for a little while. Um, he was a real gent, lovely, lovely man. Um, and kind of, it, it, it's interesting, I suppose, because that style of bowling, um, you know, you think about maybe somebody else of that similar era, somebody like Bish and Betty, who playing on, on different type of surfaces in, in India was all about sort of flight and making the ball drop out of the air. Um, and the, the way that, that covered pitches rather, or uncovered pitches rather sort of um, forced or, or, or forced that style of bowling, flat, quick, um, you know, firing the ball in and around leg stump from from around the wickets, left arm spinner, getting it to, to grip and bite and turn. And how that style of bowling kind of rather disappeared, mm. um, you know, post the the, the the covered wicket era. Um, but then you, you kind of watch him now, you watch some of the guys from India on, on pitches now that are, that, are, that are very different from that. Guys bowling at high speed, um, driving the ball into the into the deck. And it's kind of a throwback to... To, to Deadly's day. But all of the play, you know, I remember Bob Willis talking about him reverently, you know, just saying how how absolutely sensational he was because he'd be able to bowl all day, you know, keep Bob off his off his dodgy knees until it until it was absolutely necessary for him to bowl. Wonderfully accurate. Batters, of course, without all of the, the reverses and all that kind of stuff, it would be impossible to score off. Um and just must have been an absolute joy to to have in your team. So um sadly missed and those numbers are absolutely extraordinary. Mm. Yeah, I mean, for for younger uh, listeners who haven't watched much of Underwood Bowl, Kent put up a, a compilation of some of his highlights yesterday. I was amazed by his run up. He mm, properly runs run. in like a yeah. me- medium pacer, and yeah, you, you're right to, to to mention not keeping mm. because that that is that is being <laughs> delivered at some pace, yeah. at some yeah. pace. And and you know, Lawrence he he does go down as one of, if not the great English spinner, you know, 297 test wickets, the, mo- the most of any English spinner. Yeah, and it's kind of hard to sort of categorise as well. You talked about mm. the run-up there. He was he was a bit slower than a medium pacer, but he was faster than a spinner. And just reading people who played against him, so on, they'd say he sort of cut the ball rather than spun it. So he was, he was very much of his own category. And he didn't care what other people said. He got loads of advice. He just stuck to his guns. Mm. In fact, there was... I was sort of doing a bit of research on him yesterday. He was a, he was a Wisdom cricketer in 1969 because, of course, at the end of 68, he takes seven for 50 at the Oval. Mm. That famous scene with sort of nine men plus the keeper around the bat and Inverarity pads up in England Square, the series. So I was reading his profile and they, they made the point that he, in early in his career, he bowled mainly round the wicket to the right-handers. And he thought, I've got it to turn myself into a sort of fully, fully rounded bowl. I'll try over the wicket as well. In the next, so he goes over the wicket. In the next three years in first class cricket, he takes 450 wickets of 13. <laughs> it was absolutely <laughs> ludicrous. And he got, and, and basically got better after that. Yeah. So, you know, and there was a nice story actually. Boykes wrote a, a column in the Telegraph this morning about him, and he was talking about some game where it rained on the last day, Yorkshire v. Kent, and you know, Underwood was sort of licking his lips, you know, what's an uncovered pitch? He's going to have fun on this. And Boykes was chatting him in the dressing room going, Oh, if we get out here, you, you could you could take six for forty. And Underwood <laughs> said, "Yeah, but if it rains for another two hours, I'll take eight for 20. <laughs> he, he just knew exactly what everyone knew exactly what was coming. That yeah. was that was one of the great things about him. So yeah, as Butch says, sadly missed. But also, people have talked about him as someone who made the most of uncovered pitches. But his record actually didn't get notably worse no. when pitches were covered. No. And I was looking up um, his his career on Cricket Info yesterday. His his penultimate game as a as a pro cricketer. Uh, at the age of 45, uh, Kent versus Scotland in Edinburgh, eight for 31. <laughs> I'm sure that w- wasn't the driest. See, in the, the, world. the interesting thing about that though is is that that had he not had he not begun 
on you know on pitches as they were in those days across the board uncovered pitches the likelihood that if he'd have started his career as a as a bowler on on the covered ones that mm. the, the 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 likelihood that it would have panned out the same way you know people would have just decided well this guy's no good you need to turn it more you need to bowl it slower etc cetera, etc cetera. and that might well have, have, have got rid of him before he'd started you know the fact that he you know he then he then changes is able to change after having that wonderful success as the pitches were and then the reverence with which people would have treated him with anyway and the fact that he had that record behind him allowed him to to adapt and, and as most great players do you always mm. get asked the question don't you would so and so be any good in this era and and my answer to that is always yes because mm. they, they because they're great they adapt and and they will they will use whatever facilities in front of them to be as great as they were then as they are now yeah um on um spinners being a product of the environment that they brought up in um one of the themes of the county championship so far is that a couple of guys who are predominantly known for their batting have bowled really well um, and and predominantly spinners actually so uh rob yates at warwickshire um, he took a four for after scoring 175. Dan Lawrence has already bowled more overs in a county season than he ever did when he was at Essex. And in Lawrence's case, and he reminds me a bit of, of Will Jacks as a, as a spinner, really tosses it up, really tosses it up. I wonder if um, because of how much white ball cricketers, specialist spinners play uh, as kids as much as anything else, um, they're they're sort of incentivized to, to really fire it in, mm. and actually the 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 art of of properly tossing it up is is sort of being lost until the, you have these batters who come in who don't play much white ball cricket, uh, who who are almost speci- properly specialist long form um, finger spinners, and it's actually quite heartening to see them do do well. Mm. Yeah, well, I haven't got an answer to that really. Um, I, I just, I just chuckle every time I see Dan Lawrence bowl. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I mean, look, somebody like Will Jacks has has a a, a, a few things going for him. He's, he's very, very tall. Mm. Um, you know, is is able to is able to bowl the ball quite quickly if he wants to, but also gives it a huge rip. You know, he's got quite big hands and, and really turns the ball. Um, I think quite often a lot of bowlers who, who who get flatter or who want to bowl the ball flatter don't have the ability to spin it very much. So you mm. have to, you know, minimise your your um, your risk of being belted by by taking some of the trajectory off the ball. Um, all of these things are sort of products of either the the, the bowler's um, natural natural abilities or natural um, you know stature. Uh, and as much as they are the, the you know the the circumstances in which they're bowling or the conditions in which they're bowling, so it, it, it's interesting. I mean, you know, somebody like Dan Lawrence, you, you don't know, you might not see him bowl a great deal after mm. after we get past April because at the moment the pitches are so damn soft that the seamers, you know, you've got the Kookaburra ball, yes, but I will still argue that um, you know we've seen we've seen enough runs scored in, in in this time of the season. I mean the Grand National was on at the weekend. I always remember being in the dressing room doing the sweepstake in the Grand National because we were still in pre-season by then. Mm. You know we were, you weren't playing games, but the pitch is being so very very soft. Um, you know at the moment that there's not much point in the seamers bowling anyway. So that's why these guys are getting so much of a chance. Yeah, we we had a lot of questions about the Kookaburra ball. Uh, WG Rumble Pans asked, will the use of the kookaburra ball make English bowlers better in the long run. It is using the kookaburra ball actually a blessing in disguise, given the poor quality of Duke's balls last year. Um, Lawrence, on, on the on the kookaburra, it's not. I don't think about the development of bowlers. It's almost like an identification of seeing who's doing well because they don't play enough with it for bowlers to really markedly improve within a season using the kookaburra. Yeah, I mean, I understand the sort of impulse for the ECB doing it. I just think they chose the wrong time of year. I mean, the mm. pitches are too soft and the Kookaburra famously goes soft quite quickly. So mm. you've got this sort of, I was watching various games on the live stream, these guys hammering it in and it would creep along at sort of, you know, just below the knee roll. And you're thinking, who wins from this? I mean, the, they'll, they'll use the Kookaburra again in rounds 12 and 13, which is end of August, start of September. That makes more sense to me if you're trying to get, you know, develop fast bowlers who can... Get reverse swing, for example, because reverse swing was out of the equation. Lush outfields. You mm. know, talked to us at Hove last week, Sussex Northants, and both the coaches said reverse swing was a, was a, just a, couldn't work. And mm. so the Aussie bowlers, I mean, Chris Tremaine at Northants, who'd think who's a leading wicket taker in the Sheffield Shield, could barely get a wicket. This mm. two games for Northants mm. with a ball that and, and he's so, supposed to know. And how it's to. so damn cold that the, the damn thing won't swing conventionally either. Yeah. You know, and it wouldn't do. You know, we we, we looked into this, haven't we? And the, the numbers um, over the last ten years say that sort of April and was it April and July are the yeah. two best times 
to bat or the sort of like the highest average per wicket in the county championship. And that's going back 10 years. So that's notwithstanding Kookaburra ball. That's Duke Kookaburra. And, you know, at this time of year, it is it, the pitches are too soft for the ball to do anything fast enough off, off the pitch or carry through or to, or to trouble batters um, enough, whether you're using the Duke or the Kookaburra. So, look, there, there have been a couple of wins. You know, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not that... Um, um, proud to sort of say, well, okay, we've seen a lot of spin bowled. The, the, the spin has been bowled mainly to because the, <laughs> the steamers cannot do anything with it whatsoever. Um, and and yes, it's been profitable for for one or two, and it's good good to see Bashir got a game for Somerset here, didn't he? And and um, Hartley has played with with Nathan Lyon um, for Lancashire, so good to see these guys getting a getting a run out. Um, However, I, I completely agree with Lawrence. If you're going to do it, it I'm, th- I'm sort of thinking to myself, if you're going to do it, do it for the whole season. If you, want, if you really want to find out um, about, about players, then, then use it pr- th- through the whole thing. Don't mess about with nipping it in and out. And then you can make some sort of a judgment call. But playing with, playing with any ball in April on, on soft puddings of pitches is, is not going to give you any sort of clue whatsoever beyond mm. the fact that, that batters are, are having a great time. Mm. This was just, by the way, the, the third round ever where there were, wasn't a result when all 18 counties have been playing, which actually there hasn't been that long a period where that's possible because it's you need from when Durham came in when there, was, well, when there weren't two divisions and since you had the 10-8 split, uh, which came in a few years ago. Um, so yeah, not a single result. Uh, some of the highlights, Warwickshire's top three all scored 175 plus each. They scored uh, 698 for three against Durham. Uh, Matt Potts for Durham as a night watchman scored 149 not out in the same game. So obviously quite a good place to bat Edge Baston over the last few days. Um, in Division 2, Emilio Gay, Max Holden and John Simpson all scored double hundreds. Um, we nearly had a, a thrilling finish at the over where Surrey threatened, briefly threatened to chase down 210-ish from 19 overs. Um on that finish, we got a question in from Dan who asks, huge fan of the show and rely upon your collective analysis to improve my understanding and appreciation of both the finer points and grand themes of the game. I would love to understand the following. Uh, why did Somerset so readily agree to a draw against Surrey? They, had five wicket, they were five wickets down and they were on a roll, Aldridge especially. Okay, in principle, Surrey could still have achieved the target, but it was looking increasingly unlikely. They were down to their bowlers, had lost a few wickets in a row, and their run rate had plateaued. If the answer is simply that Gregory made a risk-averse decision after earlier saving Somerset from certain defeat, no worries. But the way in which the commentary team didn't seem to blink when hands were shaking what made me think there must be some well-established strategic consideration at work of which I <laughs> am ignorant. I think it's a fair question. There was a test match a few years ago, uh, England-Pakistan during COVID, where England shook hands where they needed five wickets to win in the last hour or something like that. Where obviously it's unlikely, but it could happen. What? What? Mm. But what? Why do teams shake hands I'm when not, when when a result is literally possible? It's still possible. I mean, I, the, I, Craig Overton had an injury, didn't he? Lewis Gregory's got stress fractures in his back. Um, uh, perhaps it was just simply that they they felt that they'd run out of juice. I mm. don't know. Um, you know, you've got eight matches off the reel at the, at the beginning of the season, and maybe maybe they felt that you know they might do themselves more damage than good by staying out there. I still, I, you know, you, given the circumstances, you might say, well, look, let's give it let's give it another half an hour and see mm. if we nip out two, then it, then it's well worth our while. Yeah. Um, so yeah, without knowing exactly what the state of all of the the, the Somerset bowlers were, you'd you'd be a little bit surprised, or at least if you were on commentary, you might be, unless of course they'd all had enough and just wanted to go to the pub. Um, <laughs> but you might the players you might or ask, the commentators both. Yeah. But you might ask you might ask the question um, for sure. But I, I I was listening. I I had it on. I was I was waiting for the masters to start, so I had the back end. Of the, <laughs> back end <laughs> I had the back end of the comms on, and they were zipping around the country and I was listening to uh, to the Surrey feed. And they were talking about injuries to Overton and to um, and to Gregory, and whether or not they both of them might have to miss the next game. So perhaps that mm. was a consideration. Beyond that, I can't help you. Oh, so, Surrey were five down, weren't they? They just lost a couple of quick ones, and yeah. presumably at that point they'd have started playing for the draw. At which point. Somerset figured well, there's no way we're going to prize out the last five of their just blocking. Mm. I don't know. I do take the general point, which is that county cricket can err towards a conservative side in these mm. matters. I 
can just about understand why they did what they did yesterday. Mm. I remember. I sort of remember a time going back. You know, going back to sort of like the the nineties, I suppose. Um, whereby you know we were still playing sort of Sunday league games in the middle of four days and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and you. <laughs> You might find yourself in a in a situation whereby, and, and this isn't the case because they didn't have to go off somewhere and play a, play a game the next day. Whereby you kind of make the calculation that we kind of we need to get on the road in order to give ourselves a chance of being in any sort of state mm. to uh, to compete in the next match. And so th- those type of considerations used to come up quite often. Um, but in the in the modern era, whereby you've normally got at least two days between between fixtures, um, and with points clearly so difficult to come by. Um, you, you certainly might <laughs> might have wanted to have given it another twenty minutes, half an hour before you. Well, yeah, also you got eight points for a draw and no one else is winning, so you really don't want to lose, mm. um, especially this early on, early on in the season. We've got a question in on the IPL. So Lucas asks: Are super high scoring T Twenties making the format less interesting? So yesterday, Sunrisers Hyderabad beat their own record from earlier in the competition of the highest ever domestic T Twenty score. It was two eight seven played two hundred sixty two at the Chinnaswamy. Um, Lawrence, what's your initial gut reaction when you when you see games like that? I suppose I get interested to see if someone's going to get three hundred one day. Mm. I mean, look, we can't have it both ways. We got very excited when England's white ball team started belting the hell out of it and wondering mm. you know, they passed four hundred for the first time. That's because they've never business. done it before. They'd never done no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor old Tres. Come on. So, um. So you know, so we can't then necessarily just look at the IPL and go, yeah. "This is devaluing cricket." Um, but who'd be a bowler? I think that's a fair question. And Reese Topley's a, a very good white ball bowler. Went for sixty-eight in the game you just mentioned. Mm. Um, it does feel a bit at times as if it's who's who can hit the bigger set of sixes. And d- does that does that take away from the pleasure of the joy of six? You know, Heinrich Klaassen <laughs> walloping them one after another. Mm. Are we becoming anesthetized to it? I think we are to a degree. You get that little ticker, don't you, in the the bottom mm. of the screen, the IPL five hundred and sixty-eight tournament sixes, like. That's a meaningless number. I don't know mm. what that means. What it did, that always has been, to be honest. I it mean, has, I, I, yeah. was, I always remember Adam Hollyoak said in the first year of, of T20, 2003, he said the team that hits the most sixes will win, right? Mm. If you hit more sixes than the opposition, the char- the, you'll win the game. Years ahead of his time. It's years <laughs> ahead of his time. But, but on this point, I, I, the number never matters to me. I do not mm. care. Don't care whether it's low scoring, high scoring. The only thing that makes makes the contest worth tuning in for is mm. whether it's going to be close. Yeah. And two, what was it? Two seventy odd uh, plays yeah, two two eighty. Two eighty plays two sixty. Yeah. For a long time, that game was still alive, right? And that's mm. that to me is the only thing. I don't give monkeys about mm. the numbers. Yeah, it's not an IPL only thing, by the way. No, I mean, no, no. You, you I, were in no, Pakistan for absolutely the PSL where it was quite similar last in, year in Islamabad, where 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 two forty wasn't enough to win to win the game twice. I think um, two forty mm. batting first. And look, calling those games, yes, yes, you know, you're not you're not anywhere near as, as excited about the ball flying over the boundary as you were when Beefy did it in '81. But you know, we've moved on a hell of a long way from mm. there. The only thing that matters in any of these contests, which is why I don't, I have no truck with the idea that low scoring games are somehow better because sometimes they're terrible. Mm. Um, is that if the game's close, it's a good game. If the game's mm. not close, then then you ask the question as to as you know as as to sort of like what what was the point of that. Yeah, but that's all that matters. Get close, and if and I'm telling you, if you score two eighty eight and the opposition gets to two sixty, and and with with three overs to go, the, the 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 chasing team is still in it. That's an exciting game of cricket. Yeah, I guess what what I'd wonder is, um, we're talking about golf before. And this is more your areas than mine. But <laughs> twenty odd years ago, when Tiger started whacking it further than everyone else, they yes. literally tiger proofed courses yes. by making them longer. Didn't work, but yeah. it didn't work. Yeah. But they did try and make courses longer to take out the the effect mm. of players being able to hit it further. And in games like the one yesterday, you've got a really old ground that's really small. It was not built for modern T20 cricket where mm-hmm. you've got these massive guys with massive bats who, for me, part of the issue is when players completely miss hit it for six, which does happen. Yeah. Um, and I wonder, there's nothing you can do about grounds that size. So no. is, is that... It, do we do we eventually move away from those sort of venues? I, I don't know because I don't love that. Yeah, I mean, um, it's sort of. I think I think that's perhaps that is perhaps the most sensible thing I've heard said about it. Um, you know, the 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 bat argument again. I've kind of I've gone on record so many times saying this that, that, that using golf or, or tennis or any other bat and ball sport as an analogy, hmm. that the equipment in cricket has stayed the same. 
exactly the same. It's made out of the same materials. We're not talking about sort of going from from um, ash tennis heads to sort of like to graphite and different gut strings and all that kind of stuff. The ball is slightly different. In cricket, the, the materials are exactly the same. The thing that has changed out of sight in terms of in terms of cricket has been the players. Number one, their 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 ability and their intention to hit the ball long distances, and number two, the training that they do to allow them to do that. That is, the human element has changed more than the than the equipment element. Um, and so, so what do you do about that? Well, you know, they, they've had a restriction on the size of bats and all these kind. Of, it made no difference whatsoever, none at all, because mm. the players are still stronger. They still intend to hit the ball much, much harder um, and further. If you're if you're capable of carrying the ball 110 meters and the boundary is only 70, you're going to miss hit it for six. You miss hit it for 80, right? So the, the only the only real way of doing it without without changing, you know, turning the ball into a squash ball or something, um, which the bowlers would love, uh, is is that the ground dimensions need to be bigger? You know, you need to have 80 meter carries. Mm. That's um, hard to do. I mean, you you used the example of, of here at the Oval, yeah, which mean, is one of the bigger ground surfaces in the country, but it's is, smaller is, than it used to be. Is 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 around about two thirds of the size that it used to be. Um, the carries up towards the Vauxhall end were enormous, huge. You had you to run five. Ab- yeah, you had to absolutely melt it to hit it for six up that end. Now, and and you know, by the end of my career, I was dumping them midway up the midway up the the stands. Um, you know, that all around on, on this, this grand old ground, that it, the, the carries are much, much smaller, even from the very middle. Um, and so look, that, that is, it's not an easy thing to do. I, mean, I was reading in the, uh, on Twitter or something this morning about the fact that Worcestershire might have to, might have to move from New Road because of the, the constant flooding and stuff there. And you'd think to yourself, well, okay, well, if you had the chance to start all over, start from scratch, you'd want a surface akin to somewhere like the Riverside. Um, mm. which is one of the only grounds in the country. And, and forgive me if there, if there is another. Um, maybe, maybe the, what we call it now, utility, utility bowl. Yeah. Utility. Two new, so yeah. two, two new grounds, right? And so the, the playing areas are um, a, a, a sort of requisite size for modern cricket. You know, you, you can have boundaries um, up to 80, 85 metres if you want them. Um, whereas the older grounds, of course, all, they've all shrunk because they've tried to develop them and make them make them more spectator friendly and get more more capacity in. But at, at the same time, you, you've also shrunk the playing area, mm. and so that that is a that's a huge consideration. And I think is the only way to kind of like to to make it slightly fairer in that you actually have to hit it properly to to get it to go out the ground. And you know, you talk about miss hits; these guys are still miss hitting it 70, 70 mm. yards. Um, you know, so those old the old boundaries are now sort of obsolete in most places. Mm. Uh, one Wisden award we've not yet mentioned is the Wisden Book of the Year, which was won by Scott Oliver for his book Sticky Dogs and Stardust. Yesterday, Phil had a chat with Scott about his book. Um, a lot of Wisden readers will be aware of Scott's work, sort of chronicling um, the times of legends, overseas legends playing in club cricket, and that's the essence of this book. Um, his his chat with Phil. So we're joined here in the Wisden offices here at the Oval with Scott Oliver, who I'm delighted to say has won Wisden's Book of the Year. Now, this for our YouTubers is the the book in question, Sticky Dogs and Stardust, When the Legends Played in the Leagues by Scott Oliver. Now, Scott Oliver, just for those who aren't acquainted with his work, is one of the great survivors of our industry, one of the great survivors of the Wisdom Show and Project. And he writes a monthly column for, for Joe and I, uh, for WCM, where he teases out amazing stories about great legends of the shires, if you like, these sort of monuments to club cricket life. Uh, and perhaps that was partly the inspiration behind this book. Um, Scott, first of all, cheers for dropping by into no South London for us. Um, a little bit on the book uh, and, uh, and the fact that you've won this award, what it means to you. Well, I mean, massively shocked to win the award. You know, the first thing I did was look for the Wikipedia page with a list of winners. I don't know if it exists, but I will build one if it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Probably earned myself a page there now, I would think. Um if uh, if one of Adrian Shankar's aliases get a page, then I do. Um, but yeah, amazing. Um, so thrilled. Wisdom, it's the one, isn't it? Um, it's and- certainly one of the ones. It's it's, it's, the- <laughs> it's one of the majors. Yeah, we, um, we were all delighted to see to see this result come through. It was announced this morning, but we were aware of it a little while ago. Uh, what? 
just a little little rundown of what the book is about first of all yeah so essentially it's about very famous cricketers playing league cricket as overseas pros I felt it was an untapped area of cricket writing um I got into it quite by accident just as a freelancer scrabbling around in the mud for stories I think Viv Richards was the first story so I he think, played at Rishton right in like yeah. turned up in the snow no no he might have played a game in snow there's a okay. few it's a that's a fairly common trope of these stories um Andy Roberts played in the snow mm-hmm. Alan Border but Viv I think All Out Cricket commissioned a piece on that era the golden era and in this course of that I chanced on the Lancashire League website which has all this information it just so happens that that's the place with most of the stars have been been um so I was able to dig around in there and I did a piece on Viv Richards for Crick Info was the first real chunky one um which their editor Sambit Ball said um make sure you check out this piece, if only for the pictures, which was brilliant, mm. <laughs> which mm. was delightful. But the pictures were great. Um, and he, yeah, he turns up in a helicopter. That's the one. And wows the crowds in his trilby with a Slazenger bat under his shoulder. That's, that's the pick. <laughs> that's the pick I'm thinking of. Yeah. What, what drew you to it? Um, in the sense that there's no other sport quite like it, right? Where you have these, these iconic figures who have got to the absolute apex of their, of their sport rubbing shoulders with the likes of you and me. And, and one of your stories in this, one of the chapters is, is your own experiences in effect, um, captaining Imran to here. We don't have to go down that road necessarily, but it remains this kind of peculiar eccentricity, right, of, of cricket and particularly English cricket that you have this sort of, this dichotomy of the great alongside the clubber, uh, rubbing shoulders, sharing dressing rooms and seeing how they go. Yes, but most of those clubbers will go out to bat thinking, praying, hoping they can do the business, get a 40, you know, or nick him off on a green top early on. Um, So, yeah, it's the competitive context that gives it its magic. And yes, and the fact that it's unique to cricket, I would say, as in a team sport, um, sometimes you have to rev these guys up to bowl quicker, <laughs> to, to give you the, the real deal sort of experience. Spinners, I mean, I bowled him, ran, I was his captain. I bowled him unchanged from one end for most of that season. I didn't do it in his first two years, but yeah. Um, it's the magic of, of you know, Joe Bloggs can go home at night and saying, I got 50 against Joel Garner today. Mm. Um, that's, mm. that's, where it, that's where the juice is, yeah. Um, just because a club might sign a big name uh, doesn't mean to say it's always going to work out. And this book teases out those stories as well as, as anyone who's, who's been in a cricket dressing room or a sports dressing room will attest. You can have all the numbers in the world, but if you're, if you're an iffy character, then you're going to be out on your ear and, and that book and your book brings out these kinds of stories. They tease them out. Yeah. There's a couple of little vignette in some of the chapters. Stuart McGill's has a fairly interesting season at St. Anne's, uh, which involved possible theft of a car, a lifetime league ban. There's a very similar story with Mark Vermeulen. You should look that up. Mm -hmm. People should look that up in, up in the North somewhere, but yeah, the Kevin Peterson chapter, I would say. So he was at Cannock. Cannock. Yeah. So he, um, as a 20, 19, 20 year old, wasn't he? I think he turned 20 in the season. Yeah, he he asked Nasser Hussain to find him a gig in England, expecting that to be county cricket. Um, and yeah, he, I think his average was 23 with a bat, 30 odd with a ball. So Nasser was unable to parachute him straight into county cricket there. So he played for Canuck. And I think it's fair to say most of the traits that would play out at, at various parts of his in various parts of his career with various clubs were starting to emerge at the time and yeah he rubbed quite a few people up the wrong way he was fairly full of himself and fairly uh diva-ish when things didn't um when he didn't get what he expected from the captain in particular regarding his bowling allotment <laughs> uh, many other names uh really shine through in the book adam gilchrist at richmond uh down in the south who was a model pro by all accounts they still still love him over there and Matty Hayden and Mark Taylor at, up at Greenmount CC. Hayden, of course, opened the batting with Gary Neville. And again, you get these kinds of 
fabulous stories about the, you know, the richness, if you like, of club cricket. Did you find that people were all too happy to talk to you? People, club legends, players, first team captains and so on, old chairman and, and presidents and so on. Were they, were, they, were they happy to engage with the idea of this? Yeah, I mean, pretty much everybody. Um, I think you get to a kind of tipping point or a, a saturation point with interviews. Um, when you're going, particularly the further back in time you're going, people are relying on very kind of well-thumbed mm. barroom tales. And you, you, it does start to repeat a little bit. The more recent ones, Adam Gilchrist and so forth, um, yeah, they they were all happy to engage. I think Adam Gilchrist, you know that connection you mentioned. He 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 set up a scholarship at the club, the Adam Gilchrist That's scholarship. Right. There. And so yeah, and he played for Middlesex at Richmond at the back end of his career. So I think most of them are feel good stories, and quite a few of them do finish with a connection. So they have taken that player in and they are part of the fabric of the club. That's uh, it. Imran turns up to Modishal, my club you know, every two or three years now, but more frequently before that. So yeah, that's a nice part of this as well. Joel Garner in the second book, actually, he visits every year his club Littleborough, where he played three years. Uh, took a lot of wickets. <laughs> mm, I can imagine. So, so just running running through some of the names in this in this effectively part one of the chronicles, because as you say, you're, you're you're well down the line with part two as well. But in this one, the one that's won the award, you've got names from Greenwich and Marshall to Viv, as we said, Jack Callis, Azaru Din at Rishton, Sobers as well, of course, at Norton CC, Wazi Macram, Shane Warne at Nelson CC. Now that's that's a screamer. That's worth the 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 book. Uh, just. On, on its own terms, really, Steve Waugh, Shahid Afridi, Kapil Dev. So, so you've left very few out there, but there are so many other rich stories untapped that, as you say, you are, you are well down the line to this, to this, this second one. Um, when can we hope to get hold of the second one, to, uh, Scott, dare I ask you? Uh, um, I'm hoping to finish in September, and Matt wants it in the shops by, by December. I did have to ask him whether how strict that deadline was, but we'll see. Three three a month, I think I can do it. Mm -hmm. um, Lovely. But, okay. Well, hopefully we'll see that second one out before the end of the year. Uh, in the meantime, congratulations from from all of us here. Um, feel like one of our owns come through for us here. Yeah, so it's, gr it's great much. stuff, Scott. And you'll be you'll be going to the do uh, at Lords this yep. evening, as as it stands, because this show will be going out tomorrow. Um, does the tuck still fit, dare I ask? I didn't own one. <laughs> I've had to buy one for <laughs> this night. <laughs> so I think I'm going to bill that to the publisher, to be fair. Sure. But... Best of luck with that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, um, it's, a, it's a beautiful piece of work. We had a bit of a hand helping along, along the way. I did some, some editing work on it as well. It's a real stunner of a piece of work. Here it is yet again. Sticky Dogs and Stardust, when the legends played in the leagues. Scott Oliver, you're a cracking bloke. Thanks ever so much. Thank you for having me. Cheers, Phil. Sticky Dogs and Stardust, the Wisdom Book of the Year by Scott Oliver, is available to buy on the Wisdom Shop. Save 10% when you use the coupon code STICKY10. That is everything for today. Cheers, Butch. Cheers, Lawrence. A reminder that the 2024 Wisden is out on Thursday. Didn't have a row this time. Didn't have a row this time. It's a love one. <laughs> <laughs> um, cheers, everyone. Cheers for getting through the show. We'll be back this time next week.